At that time, Prabhupada lived in a grass hut. There was no other place to live in. I remember Prabhupada one time was sitting in the grass hut and he just, he just said, this grass hut is in the mode of goodness. And this is all you need for spiritual life, live in a grass hut and live by the side of the holy river, chant Hare Krishna. But if we do this, people won't come here. So we have to build the big buildings with concrete and steel and bricks. Those buildings are in the mode of passion. But for preaching, we can build those buildings. But for our own selves, this should be enough. Prabhupada really liked Mayapur. You know, he seemed really relaxed in Mayapur when we would come. Remember the one time he went up to his quarters when he first got there, and of course I'd follow him in, he was setting everything up, and he was just looking out his window. You know, his windows, of course, were on each side of his room. So he walked in the in his door, front door, and he just looked out his window, and you know, then it was just stretches of fields everywhere. There was it was wide open and very tranquil, very peaceful. And he would just chant, you know, and look out there. And one time he turned. And he just looked at me and he smiled and he said, So, Sruta Kirti Maharaj, you like it here in Mayapur? And I said, Yes, Prabhupada, very much. The way his quarters were set up there, they had the padding, you know, across the entire room. So sometimes you could go in there in the middle of the day and Prabhupada would just be laying on the floor and he'd have his feet over the big bolster pillars that were against the walls. He would just move one out a little bit so he'd just have his legs hanging over the bolster pillow and it'd just be just relaxing. Prabhupada was so happy that we had cows. He said, this is very auspicious. He said, if the cows are grazing on the land where we're going to build the temple, then uh, by passing cow dung and walking over the land, it's going to make it very auspicious for the temple. Prabhupada wanted us to feed the local villagers, so we had, uh, even before we had a building, we had a big pot for cooking and distributing prasadam. Prabhupada used to take, go on walks, and he liked to walk along the uh, pathways in between the fields. He called these the little highways. As he'd be walking, then the villagers would offer him respect and pay obeisances was a very informal, friendly environment with all the local villagers. Prabhupada would walk out in the fields and then he'd look and he'd say, here there'll be a spiritual city one day. I have seen that Prabhupada morning walking time, one um, villagers, he's taking some uh, sobji, vegetables, to nearby market. Then Prabhupada stops suddenly. Then he says, why are you going? I have to sell this vegetable to the market. Then Prabhupada says, why not you are giving to the temple? You can serve Radha Govindo by giving your vegetables. Then he has agreed, he purchased all the vegetables, big bucket he purchased. Then he told Jayapataka, then Jayapataka paid his uh, amount. He told that vegetable man, please you come every day and talk to the temple manager and give sabji vegetable, fresh vegetables to the Radha He has all the time mind to give fresh flowers, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. I have seen also sometimes in Calcutta, somebody purchase not fresh fruits. So he was very annoyed. Why you do not buy the fresh fruits for Radha So I have seen same thing, fresh vegetables. He likes to offer Krishna. One day it was the Govardhan Puja and we built a big mountain of rice and we fed many people and the people took their leaf plates after taking prasadam and then they threw it behind the building and then Prabhupada uh, was living up on the second floor and we were sitting in the room together and then he heard dogs barking and kids shouting and so then he got up and walked back on the veranda uh, behind his room and he looked over and he saw that there was this big pile of leaf plates of people that had eaten their meal and there was little scraps on the plates. So then uh, there were some 
very poor children with sticks in their hand, fighting off some very hungry dogs, trying to get the scraps of food that people hadn't finished eating on their plate. When Prabhupada saw that how these children were so hungry that they had to eat the things that people threw away, and how they were fighting with the dogs to get these scraps of food, tears swelled in his eyes and he said, we had to see that nobody goes hungry within a 10 mile radius. The temple is the house of God. God's everyone's father, Krishna's everyone's father, so in the presence of the father, the son doesn't go hungry. So like that, we have to make an arrangement that people get fed. And so that was uh, inspiration for regular prasadam distribution. He talked also with a gentleman called Mr. Geoffroy. He was the founder of La Vie Claire, which means the clear life, the pure life, which was the first health food store, vegetarian health food store that we had in France. So this was a very, very wonderful personality. It was Prithuputra, made him come. And Prabhupada had a very long talk with him about eating pure food. Mr. Joffre, of course, was explaining how they wanted to give very pure food in their stores. And Prabhupada, he wanted us to have a farm at that time. We didn't have it yet. We didn't have new Mayapur. So Prabhupada was telling him, so we will have honey in our farm, so we can bring our honey and you can sell it. And we will have milk, so you can also sell our milk. But Mr. Joffre was saying, yeah, but the problem is that it's going to be very polluted. And Prabhupada said, no, we, we're not going to use uh, pesticides, so it's going to be um, pure. But the gentleman said, but even if the grass is pure, the air is impure, so it will go on being polluted. Then Prabhupada said, well, that's for the reason that it's impossible to have everything perfectly pure. So that's why we are offering everything we are eating to Krishna. That's the way to have things perfectly pure. Otherwise, it's impossible in this material world to have completely pure food. Yogeshwar had tried to get some people from politics to come see Prabhupada, and one of them agreed to come. He was called Mr. Mesma, and he was a senator. And what was very interesting is that Prabhupada, whenever he was talking, especially with Christians, but also with politicians, he always wanted to talk about not killing the cows, not killing animals. So they had a discussion, and Prabhupada was telling this uh, gentleman that if you absolutely want to eat cows, then just wait until their natural death, and then you can eat them. And we were very surprised because it was the first time that we heard Prabhupada mentioning something like that. <laughs> but he said, Prabhupada said, in that way, you will always have meat to eat because there will always be cows dying and you don't have to kill them. So that was uh, very surprising also to the gentleman who certainly didn't put it in practice. But it was an interesting point that Prabhupada could consider, okay, if you absolutely want to eat meat, then do, but at least wait until their natural death. And another time he was looking out there and just looking across the lawn, the trees, and he said, so, he said, do you know what's the most beautiful animal? And, uh, you know, whenever Prabhupada would ask you a question like that, of course, you either wanted to know the right answer and say it, or you didn't want to say anything at all because you didn't want to say the wrong answer. So, of course, I was thinking, I was thinking different animals, and I thought, well, you know, you had to say a cow, you know. Krishna loves the cows, you know, he's Govinda. So finally, after a little bit, I said a cow, and Prabhupada just laughed, and he said, no, no, he said, the horse. He said, the horse is the most beautiful. He said, it's body and its muscle structure. And I said, oh, yes, Prabhupada. A lot of devotees don't know this, but actually Prabhupada did name the, the land Yugokula. And that's why he named the deities Radha Gokula Nanda. And he wanted the main activity there to be Goraksh or cow protection. He wanted 150 cows kept on the property. And I said, but that's not very practical because of the 17 acres of land, there's only six acres, which is pasture land. But I said, you need at least one acre per cow. And he said, so? You buy another 150 acres of land. What is the difficulty? This is the most important duty 
uh, to look after the cars and explain the importance of car protection. He said also we should purchase a double-decker bus and drive the bus into central London and fill the bus up with Western tourists, Western people, and bring them out to the manor so they can be educated in simple living and high thinking. He said besides uh, showing them how the, the cow is protected, we should also be producing milk for sale and butter and yogurt and also ghee. He said if we make our own ghee, he said so many people want to purchase the ghee uh, because there's nothing like um, homemade ghee. And uh, he said that the other activities that devotees should be doing there is uh, spinning and weaving and different handicrafts. This is what he wanted to happen there. Then I asked him about the Indian community. I said, should we cultivate the Indian community? And he said, they're already Krishna conscious. So we should concentrate on the British community. He said, they know nothing about Krishna. He seemed very happy to to just be in Mayapur, which at the time it was almost in the middle of nowhere. You know, it wasn't like like Vrindavan, you know. We go up and down the road. There was lots of activity, but here it was just very peaceful and Prabhupada really enjoyed it. Sometimes like in the afternoon or the morning, he would just go out with his beads, walk around on the veranda and just look out. And that's you know, just like here you just see expanses of just beautiful fields. Nice, peaceful, flat. And he would just walk around and chant. And he would gaze, you know, gaze across from his veranda. It's just like when he went to other areas, like in L.A., you know, there's different kinds of management. When he went to Vrindavan for that one month, you know, all those activities, nectar of devotion classes. You know, he had a program. There was a mission. But when he went here, it didn't seem like that. Prabhupada was very very casual, very relaxed. He certainly manifested different times of you know, his deep emotion for Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. One morning we took a walk with Srila Prabhupada. At one stage a bullock cart passed by with a few passengers in it. Srila Prabhupada commented how how nice the simple life was, how people don't really need motor cars and luxuries, um, but they can just live very simply. We would walk past fields and Prabhupada said that all you really need to live is grains, rice and dal. He said you don't even really need to have vegetables to live, you can just live from grains. and. Um, save time for Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada went for a morning walk in Talavan. And Prabhupada came out in this open field. And as soon as he stepped out of the woods and out of the field, he stopped and looked at the devotees. And he had a, a serious concern in his countenance. And he asked, why are these fields fallow? And why aren't there any men working in these fields? And where's the oxen? And that really impressed me. I was the only one farming at that time. I didn't say anything. But it really touched me that Prabhupada was you know, attentive to what was being done in the agricultural realm. He had an awareness of the importance of an agrarian culture not just for the sake of, you know, having your own food if and when the economy fails and all that, but for the sake of, as he explains, you know, living off nature's gifts as a matter of relationships where everything and everyone is, you know, assisting everyone and everything else in serving Krishna. And that kind of spirit fosters an appreciation for everyone and everything, which also fosters more appreciation of the designer of this whole perfect arrangement. And also, you know, seeing food is more than food and water is more than water, but sacraments. I've been doing farm work and conservation work all my life. 
And I'd seen the plight of the American farmer, you know, from 1950 on. I saw the introduction of tractors and, and how they displaced the draft animals, from which came overproduction of food, from which came um, government paying the farmers more for not growing than they get for the crops, from the farms all going under, being bought up by the big exploitive farmers. So I saw this whole syndrome, and then I saw by this concern, and it wasn't just a question, there was a you could see in his face a serious concern that this would befall the devotees in New Vrindavan because he was aware of this whole tendency and syndrome. You know, his, his terminology, like, you know, defining the tractor as the killer of the bull. If, if you're not seeing yourself as dependent on the land and dependent on the oxen, then you're, you're not going to have the proper appreciation. You're not going to have cow protection. On, on the level of what he defined as, you know, the cows are jolly. They're not jolly unless they're contributing to society. So seeing these, you know, these things that Prabhupada would pick up on gave me such an appreciation of the depth of his wisdom and the integrity of his understanding of all aspects of spiritual life. The next step, the next key component uh, was the establishing of the Goshama. Krishna Balaram now needs to drink milk. <laughs> Just like they did 5,000 years ago when they were herding Nanda Maharaj's 100,000 cows. So Prabhupada called me into his room and he says, I'd like you to establish a Goshala. Krishna Balaram need milk and my disciples need to maintain health and vitality. Because in those days in Vrindavan, basically the milk that we were drinking was either watered down buffalo milk or very watered down, God knows what, milk. <laughs> so that was important. So what do I do? Prabhupada has told me to start a Goshala. I didn't have any money. I didn't really know how to begin. So I had a Seiko watch on my wrist. And I thought, right, I'll sell my Seiko watch. And then Bhagaji, um, one older Indian gentleman that Prabhupada regarded as his right-hand man in India. And Bhagaji helped me incredibly over so many years uh, in my service to Srila Prabhupada. So he took me to Govardhan Market, where there would be a monthly cow auction. And from the proceeds of selling my Seiko watch, I think we got about eight or nine hundred rupees in those days for it, I was able to purchase two cows. <laughs> and that's how the Goshala started. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada leaving the temple in 197 Dank Street, which is one block off from the ocean. Beaconsfield Parade is the name of the road that goes along the ocean there. And Srila Prabhupada in the morning would walk out there and go along. Now because Prabhupada's getting into the car, it, it indicated that he would be going down to the botanical gardens. Because if he was going on to the beachfront, he would just, you know, walk. This is Prabhupada arriving in the botanical gardens there in Melbourne, which was a very uh, beautiful place. You know that the British had the tradition of building these elaborate botanical gardens in whatever they would have the colonies, whether it was in Africa or in uh, India 
though Australia was like that too. They would have these elaborate botanical gardens that they would construct and they would bring all these different exotic trees into one place. And uh, Srila Prabhupada would go early in the morning and he would come and say, they spent so much money building this and now look at in the morning no one has come to take advantage of it. We're the only ones. Prabhupada would be walking in the botanical gardens at 7 in the morning and everybody else would be whizzing by and their cars going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and we would be taking advantage of their botanical gardens. Srila Prabhupada would preach the philosophy of Krishna consciousness using nature. He, he would tell us many times that you can learn from nature. And when he would be going on these morning walks, he would point out things. And he would amaze us. Sometimes he would say, oh, this is a certain type of a tree. And he would quote the name of the tree in Latin like he was some kind of a botanist and lo and behold would go and look at the tree and the name would be there and it would be that tree. And he would point out the medicinal value in the trees and Prabhupada was very educated, not just in uh, spiritual things, but he had so much material knowledge that he would amaze the devotees. Mauritius was developed by two devotees. It's a small island off the east coast of Africa. Prabhupada said some very profound things in Mauritius. He was very serious with the, the young people who came to visit him. Uh, he didn't like the idea of dependence on a cash crop. Sugarcane was the cash crop. His comment to those young people was, the first duty of a nation is to become self-sufficient. And that was a, an extremely profound statement. Because if you look at the world situation and you look at so many of the trouble spots, it's all about trying to exploit somebody else's natural resources, like America and Europe trying to exploit the, uh, the oil resources of other areas. And if each country would take that seriously, becoming self-sufficient, you know, you wouldn't have these major conflicts going on in the world. So when Prabhupada said that, it was extremely profound. When one asked, uh, well, what is your uh, movement doing to help the world? And he said, we're taking animals and turning them into human beings. And then he gave a very fiery lecture. And then at the end, he told Brahmananda, take the tape of this and send it to back to Godhead, and they should make an article out of this. The title of the article should be, first you make them human, then you talk about United Nations. This house for Prabhupada to stay was given by Mr. Madhvani, who actually was the sugar king of uh, Uganda, Madhvani Sugar Mills. We, you know, we found out that Mauritius doesn't have a sugar refinery, that actually the sugar cane is crushed into juice, and then that's shipped to England, and it's refined in England. And then Mauritius has to buy his sugar from England, although it's growing all the sugar cane. So Prabhupada was telling him, why are you providing sugar for the British, uh, for their teacups? Just so that you get money, and then with the money, then you buy electronic goods. You have to import everything, because you're not making anything. And even food was uh, imported. So Prabhupada said, instead of growing sugar cane, you should be growing your own food. Be self-sufficient in food. But uh, you're just being exploited. You know, it goes back to the colonial times and the British Empire. Prabhupada didn't approve of cash crop. He approved of the food crop. So this was, you know, something revolutionary. Nobody ever told him this. And he told it also to the government officials that he met. This was part of the Krishna consciousness movement, to be self-sufficient, be self-sufficient in food. I was the temple president of New Vrindavan for, you know, so many years, and Prabhupada had a vision for a pilgrimage site in North America and a farm community. So he never emphasized book distribution to us. He explained to me that especially at the end when I was with him in Bombay and in Vrindavan just before he left, that the second half of his movement would be dramatically different than the first half. You know, the emergency tactics that he used to distribute books and give young people sannyas and open as many temples as possible, 
he wanted places like New Vrindavan to establish the culture of Krishna consciousness with colleges, uh, grihasta lifestyle, uh, all of the things to demonstrate the philosophy that he uh, was so careful to present in his books. So he, right up to the end, was telling me that the farm communities were so important for the second half and the, and the vision would be so different than when his movement got started in the Western world. Srila Prabhupada had been standing looking at the wonderful fields. The devotees were gathered around. There were, were two fellows who were new devotees, very enthusiastic. They were country boys from not too far away. And they had brought from their own garden a medium-sized basket full of vegetables. And Srila Prabhupada picked up an eggplant out of the basket and he just held it in his hand as though it were a jewel of some sort. And, and he held it kind of up and just looked at it. It had a real value, this produce. You can just tell his pleasure was immense. So at some point, he, he spoke about how we should be able to feed the neighboring city temples, supply them with very luscious kinds of fresh foods like this. But not only that, but in time of need, we should be prepared to also produce an abundance sufficient to feed people living in a 10-mile radius. Prabhupada took a walking tour of the barn and the machine area. And um, Parmananda was a little bit apologetic because Prabhupada had been to New Taliban a few months ago and chastised them for having farm equipment. But actually, they had farm equipment and was standing outside and the weather getting rusty. And at Gita Nagri, we had a lot of farm equipment, but everything was very well protected. But Parmananda was very much self-conscious. So as he was showing Prabhupada the different equipment, he was saying, and this is a disc and it'll do the work of so many men, and this is a you know, plow and it'll do the work of so many men. And Prabhupada was very silent. But when Prabhupada gave his class later on that evening, he said, it's not that we hate machinery, everything can be used in Krishna service. He also very much caught our mood that we didn't want to be in the cities. And so when Prabhupada noted that, he commented in his class, it's not that we hate the towns and villages, everything belongs to Krishna. So he saw our mentality and he cut through it very effectively. Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bhajo Me Varnasam Dharma is so essential that people remain in Sattva. Mm. Samagam Rajagam Rajasthama Bhava increases lust and greediness, and that implicates the living entity to exist in this material world in many, many forms. Uh, that is very dangerous. Therefore, uh, they should be brought into such a room that they shall be spent of Varnasandhana. How to bring people in such a room? The uh, Brahminical qualification, very neat and clean. Rise out in the morning, 
मंगलाल के मंदिर पर तुस्ते इन सबों नंदन कनाल भी इंफ्लुएंस वही चामोगों नजर दैट इज ए स्पेशल फीचर of human life.